All right, Billy, what the hell is going on here? I think most people know you from Fire Festival. How does this all kind of unravel? Do you have a moment where you start to say, oh shit, this is gonna be a disaster? Someone's gonna die in here. You have to get it done immediately. It was pitch black, they were wasted, we weren't ready, and it's like chaos just erupted. Pure mayhem. Oh my God. How much money did you raise? 27 or 28 million. Wow. You have to do this or else you're gonna be in the cover of Wall Street Journal in handcuffs. I didn't fathom what I had done was a crime. Is that true or no? You're doing Fire Festival too, so I can't, I can't tell if this is like one of the dumbest things or if you have some <laughs> of the biggest balls in the world. Yeah. All right, Billy, what the hell is going on here? What's what's happening now? You let's go back with you a little bit. We're, we're super excited to interview you. First great. of all, yeah, thank great you, to be here. Thank you for doing Thanks, this. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I think most people know you from Fire Festival, but for those that need a little bit more context or you provide a little more context, Give us a little bit of background, you before Fire Festival. Like even when you were little, like were you an entrepreneur when you were little? You know, Fire Festival was literally only four months. It was a trailer video of an idea in December with a promise for a date in April, and then like four months of craziness. And all the stories are just from those like pieces of four months. But there was so much that led up to that moment that allowed all the good things and allowed all the really really bad things, which were terrible, to happen. So yeah, so much more than just a four month period and crazy how like. Your entire life story gets condensed into just four months. I want to get more than I want to go like way back with you. Like when you were a little boy, were you entrepreneurial? I think the biggest curse and biggest gift was I got a computer in fifth grade. And this is like in the early, early days of like cable Internet. So just transitioning from super slow dial up to actually being able to do things online. And so I was like, what, 10 years old and got this computer and quickly learned this was the place where I had no rules and had no boundaries. No parents, no teachers, no siblings, no relatives could tell me what to do. And I can kind of go on the internet. And it was lawless at the time. And that was kind of my coming of age online. So what are you doing online when you're 10 years old? Like, what is it? Are you watching porn? Are you crafting a, a, a like, are you on? What's that game that you fucking guys all play? Minecraft, Warcraft, whatever the fuck no, it's no, called. No, no, no. See, like, what are, young what, people these days will never understand the what pain it was like. of dialing up through <laughs> Um, you know, like a 56 K. Yeah. I understand modem. that. I understand that. But are you, are you just online browsing the internet? Or are you like building something? I just build basic websites to start. Got it. And then I started building websites and basically pretending like I was an adult to all these business guys online. And, you know, I was like parading around with a really terrible fake deep voice. Like my voice now isn't even deep, but it's they're like as a 10 year old trying to have a deep voice. It's hilarious. <laughs> Talking all these 40 year old guys trying to start businesses from my basement in my, my parents' house. But what kind of businesses were these? So, and I guess what I'm trying to get at is were you always a hustler? Were you always working for yourself? You know, always looking for new ideas to, to, to build businesses again? I think I didn't really know what a business was, but it felt like I could, if I had my own resources, I could create freedom that I didn't have in my real life. So, I wanted to put my website online and realize that I'd pay somebody, like pay a server company to put the website online. Like, all right, I'll just start a server company. So, then when I was 13, I started a server company and hired three full-time employees in India who each worked eight-hour shifts, seven days a week. There it is, Billy. That's, <laughs> what, I, that's what I was asking. That's what I want to know. I knew there was something. I had to pull it out of you. I knew it. You created a fucking server company. And the, that is wild. Yeah, I got in trouble when I got in, like a wedding invitation. The, the head guy's name was Rex. So I got his wedding invitation in India in the mail like two years later. My mom's like, what the hell is some grown man from India doing inviting you to his wedding? So house came crumbling down. I, I was wait. I knew there was like, there's, I feel like there's breadcrumbs that lead yeah. up to this moment. What were these other breadcrumbs that, that you remember looking back on your childhood like that? I started a website in the MySpace era and I called it your hot site. And it was meant to be a private MySpace for middle school kids. And it was like really, really awesome for four days until the principal called me in and is like, someone's going to die in here. You have to shut it down immediately. Uh, so that was like my first like you introduction should. to like, wow, I can build something online that everybody in my life that I know at the time, like all my middle school friends, but all use. And that was just like the coolest feeling in the world. So I think like that kind of gave me the adrenaline that like, wow, I can actually like type something at home that impacts people's lives. Like that's really, really wild. You're hot. You should bring that back. Uh, your hot site. Yeah. Your, it's just called your hot site. It's your hot site. Yeah. So it's, I was 13. So 20, 2003, 2004. Yeah. And this is like wow. a time, I mean, the, the, you, you know, it's interesting. I think a lot of people that kind of came up during this time, like the internet to your point was like a little bit long. I mean, it still is, but it was like, 
there was no real guidelines, rules, regulation. Yep. People were just trying to like figure it out. You didn't really, you know, you're surfing around. You don't really know what you're doing. I think kids were stumbling around. Um, at what point do you realize that using this tool, you can actually start making a substantial income? So in high school, um, I had a customer who I had known since I was like 11 or 12 years old who was paying me for like web posting for three or four years now. And he, he said he was like 35 living in London. And it finally came out like my junior year of high school. He was the exact same age as me, like same year as school, but like in London, like totally pretending as well. And we're like, all right, we got to build something together. So fast forward to my freshman year of college, I call him up. We create our first startup together. He ends up dropping out of school and comes to America for the first time, moves in with me when we were 18. So it's like that connection from like our 12 or 13 year olds, like lying in our bedrooms, but how old we are became like a tangible business in the U.S. So that was pretty wild. Is this something that you're just naturally good at? Like, were you were you actually like doing the coding and stuff? Uh, I was initially, but this guy is way better than me. He works at Google now. He's like an absolute beast. And yeah, he was like way better than me at coding. So I'm like, hey, come like take over and take me to the side and like build this thing for us. So you've essentially been starting businesses since you were 10 years old. For sure. I think the internet was cool because you can just meet people that I wasn't able to meet. If I'm 13 years old in like a New Jersey suburb, I wasn't meeting some crazy programmer from London, right? But like the internet let me do that. So yeah like a really fun way to just find different things that they couldn't access in my life. So what do you think? Okay. So obviously we're going to talk about fire and then what you're working on now, but you said this all happens in a four month period. What was the motivation? Cause I, it, it sounds like you had the music app mm -hmm. and then you were doing the festival as kind of like, was it a promo thing or was it, you wanted to get in the live event space? Like how did, I guess what I'm trying to get at is how does this four month period that derailed your life in a lot of ways, one, take off so quickly. And then two, how does this all kind of unravel? So someone I'm working with now is doing due diligence on me. And they called a woman who I used to know, like in the four months leading up to Fire Festival, who was basically talent that was like there for some of the promo shoots. And they're like, oh, how is Billy as a guy? And like, she's like, yeah, things were great, except I knew it wasn't going to work when he told me he'd only been to one music festival in his entire life before Fire. So it's like, I was not a music festival guy by any stretch of the imagination, which I think is like kind of wacky. Um, I was a tech guy and I built an app that was trying to be like the Uber for talent where anybody can book artists. And I was using like my love for the Bahamas and the ocean and travel to as a sales tool to bring all these talent and be like, hey, look, like here's why you should sign for my company and not some other agency. And it was on one of these trips. I had a high school friend who goes, you should just do a music festival here. So it like, wasn't my idea. It was, wasn't any of my employees' ideas. It was like a random high school buddy who's like, yeah, this place is incredible for a music festival. Okay. And so you go in with just blind ambition, no prior experience. You start, I mean, we have to talk about, you start working with Ja Rule and you get a lot of celebrities. Like how do you even begin to start approaching these people and get them to sign on with, you know, I guess, lack of experience? Yes, I think the biggest misconception and like this, what bothers me the most, that people think I woke up one day, started lying and I did lie and it was, it was terrible. And like all of a sudden attract all this money and islands and talent, whatever you want to call it. Like, it took so many years of having small failures and small successes to build this trust up, which I violated. And arguably, I think that's, that's even worse. But it was moving to New York as like an 18, 19 year old entrepreneur when all of my peers were in college, starting businesses and just like finding myself in these crazy rooms and crazy scenarios that allowed these four months of fire, which, you know, have been told many times now to happen. So how did you like approach Jaw Rule and have him like, like, are you like texting his agent? Like, how does that even happen? So I had a company called Magnesis that was building good experiences and benefits on like on top of your credit card. It's so, like our pitch was like the Amex black card for, you know, young millennials in New York City. And for that card, we were doing private concerts for all of our customers. So I had booked maybe two dozen like smaller rappers to perform these private concerts. And during this, I realized how broken this booking process was. Like you guys know this world where you speak to somebody who claims to be your manager, but it's really like the cousin of the guy's brother who like knows your PR person. And it's like, it's all crazy, like opaque world that makes no sense. And I'm sitting here after booking two dozen people. I'm like, dude, I can just build an app that removes all of these like fakers throughout the process and allow like people like me to contact these artists directly. So that was the impetus of it. And I had most of my talent relations at the time through these Magnesis events which had gone well on a much, much smaller scale, obviously. What's interesting to me is you sound like a behind the scenes type of mm -hmm. guy. Like it, you sound like you like like being behind the app and building the app, not necessarily in front of it. Is that true or no? Yeah, I think 
the issue and like, which there's plenty of bad decisions they made during fire, but kind of got lost in the uh, excitement of the islands and the airplanes and like trying to do a music festival on one of the most beautiful places on earth. It certainly was a, you know, as a 24 year old, I was chasing after the shining objects and, you know, it led me astray. At what point when you're planning all of this, do you start to think, hey, maybe this is going to go astray? Or was there never that moment? There was never like that moment where like I'm not, it's not going to work, but it was a total roller coaster of really bad and really good. And I just remember the moment where we launched, we had like 18 of the bigger talent on the island. We had them all post this orange tile at the same time, like physically with us. And then hundreds around the world posted it right after them. And nothing happened for the first four or five hours. And like I'd put every dollar I had into this like launch moment. And this and was for people to go and sign up and buy, to tickets. buy tickets. Okay. Like, Fuck, no one wants to go to this thing. And I went to bed all depressed thinking like I'm now broke and like having a festival and I'm stuck on this island. Like, how am I going to pay everybody $2 million like next week? And then I met like my guy comes to my door, wakes me up at 7 a.m. Kelly, Kelly, we were screwed. I'm like, shit, we sold no tickets. Like, Dude, we sold millions of dollars of tickets. Like, how are we ever going to build this thing? So it went from like, we're totally screwed. We have nothing to, oh shit, we've sold so much. How can we actually make this happen? And I think like that was pretty indicative of the emotions the entire time where it's always the extremes. But there was never like a time where you could step back and be like, oh shit, like this probably isn't actually going to work. It was more like the extreme emotional thinking. So when you sell all these tickets in, this, in the morning, how do you even start, start planning? Like wh wh what do you do? I mean, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. So we were on a small island, like in the middle of middle, like middle of nowhere in the ocean. So I like chartered three or four. Where exactly is the island? Uh, at this point, we're on Norman's Key, okay. which is in the Exumas yeah. in the Bahamas. Yeah. Uh, the population there might be like, at the time, like eight people like who actually live there full time. Uh, so we fly to the main, like main capital island, Nassau. I like go into the private airport hangar. I'm like, all right, everybody has to wait like six hours. I just start making phone calls and have everybody come in. I'm like, where can we do this thing? Where can we go? And just like start renting islands and striking deals from the airport in Nassau. And like we have four months to put a festival together. And like that just started a chain of events, which were totally wild. How much is it to rent an island? Oh, uh, crazy. Uh, it was really bad. Um, probably spent a couple million dollars total on like rentals for four months, if not more. So it's like it's it's millions of dollars to rent an island. Rent yeah. So then you get so you get the money, then you get committed because you spent the money. And now you're sitting there like, OK, I got to get all these people here. At this point, it was game on. We'd sold these tickets. We have every brand blowing up our phone. We had all the talent who had told us we were crazy six months ago. Now, like we just wanted to come to the Bahamas for the fire app saying, oh, like, forget the app. Want to be part of the festival. Like, you know, we were in my own little world on top of the world at that point. So it no longer became at the dollars or cents. It's like, how can we make this three days that the entire world will talk about for the rest of their lives? It, it became this one track mindset. It sounds like your intentions were like to have a really incredible festival. But totally naive, like just couldn't zoom out and be like, wait a second, you can't build a city here in four months. Doesn't matter if I had a billion dollars, which I did not have. Like, doesn't matter if I was the best builder in the world and never built anything. It's like, you just can't possibly do this and just didn't know how to. But when, pe when, when talent and people start showing up and it's not built the way, like, do you have a moment where you start to say, oh shit, this is going to be a disaster or? That you... really never happened. I think a lot of people in hindsight are like, oh, I knew on this trip. I think that's all bullshit. We had enough little things going for us, like enough bill as it actually existed there that we were renting out, like enough physical assets that were actually ours that were so good. And we were amazing at the best, like the hundred person festivals that we did every couple of weeks leading up to it. Like every single one of those is perfect. We just didn't have the expertise or I didn't have the expertise to do it with 3000 people at the time. And when, when, when you're planning this, when people start arriving, are mm -hmm. you freaking out as they arrive or it, were you still not, were you fine? Yeah. Like for the first time I thought I was screwed in my entire life was the night before the festival was supposed to start and the storm came through out of nowhere. And like, I had probably like 10 or 12 core, like actual festival people who were building the festival site who were all like super energetic experienced, like nothing's going to stop us type of people. And I come into our main war room and all their heads are like down in the kitchen sinks and the tables are passed out in the couches. I'm like, fuck, I just lost everybody. And that was when I knew that like, we were screwed, but it literally was not until the night before. And this is at midnight. And there was no way to stop people from coming at this point. So we had, you... we chartered two 730, like this is crazy. We chartered two 737 planes, set up a fire terminal, Miami International Airport, and had these planes scheduled to go back and forth all day long for four days, two weekends in a row. Uh, so like, they started to arrive at sunrise. So at 7.30 that morning, you know, the first 7.37, which was brand new with a fire logo on it. We had like girls in bikinis, like stenciled on the plane. Like it was, it was, it was absurd, right? 
so at like 7 30 in the morning the first plane arrives and I'm like all right we're still going to pull this off but i made the final decision there that crushed it I'm like okay our festival site is not ready yet so let's send them to a beach on the other side of the island bring all the booze the boats the jet skis like give them a great time and like give us all day to build the festival site and by the time they came back it was pitch black they were wasted we weren't ready and it's like chaos just erupted what, what happens when the chaos erupts because I, I don't you know you've seen, it's been a while since i've seen the documentary yeah. um but i remember it was just like absolute pandemonium and people posting like what what was that like being there and experiencing all of that so i think i should have realized when the top 10 or 12 like management level people who were all incredible when they gave up like physically and mentally gave up i should have realized like i was screwed on your then. team yeah they yeah. like they didn't verbalize it, but it was pretty clear by their body language. Like they were like, they realized that their whole dream of making this happen was dead in the night before. And at that point is when I should have called it quits because I just felt like, where did everybody go? I have 700 people working here at this moment, like a lot of contractors and whatever underneath these 10 or 12. I'm like, I can't find anybody. And I could find like two people who worked there. Where'd they go? I don't know. And it's like, it speaks to my bad management ability at the time. And like, clearly the 10 or 12 leaders were out of it. But I just felt like I was alone on this like whatever, milk crate or milk carton trying to direct traffic and everybody was gone. Like, where the fuck is everybody? Are you staying up all night at like the night before? Like, are you yeah. awake all night? Yeah, for sure. It was a mess. How, and how many days are you awake for? Because I, I mean, how do you go to bed? Yeah, I think it was like two or three days where it was just pure, pure mayhem. Oh my God. So you remember so, the sandwiches, Lauren? What happened with the sandwiches? Remember those like the people that... Okay, like, why were the sandwiches like such a such a thing? For the, someone who's listening that has no context, why? Was yeah, that the, the food actually wasn't wasn't bad. Like the food was totally... It wasn't five stars advertised, but the food was like definitely pretty good. And the story is that two kids were high and went up to Andy King and said, hey man, all I want is a cheese sandwich. So he made that like those two guys a cheese sandwich. And my number one response here is if we served, I think there's like a thousand people there, a thousand cheese sandwiches, there'd be more than one picture, right? Like every, everybody would You're take saying a that picture. cheese sandwich basically just it was got a, one -off. a lot of, a lot of, yeah, press. it was like literally two guys asked for it and he made it for them. When you're actually in it and how you've seen it portrayed on social media, were there a lot of, uh, things that were inaccurate? Um, I never watched documentaries. I think like the never once, no, never once. I think the crux of it was wrong. Like. I think morally the biggest crime were these people who were backing me since I was 18 or 19 years old, who I took advantage of in the four months leading up to Fire Festival. And like, that's fucked up. I think as far as the actual event, like we all busted our asses to make this thing work. And anybody who's working the festival, no one thought it, like it wasn't going to work beforehand. Like afterwards, they can say it to make themselves look smart, but everybody working there thought this thing was going to happen. So I think the crime was more about like the abused trust and not the actual festival itself. And w remind me, what were you actually charged and convicted of so wire fraud for lying to investors to raise money in the you know months leading up to the festival okay so is that when you when you say you were out of integrity before the four months leading up to the festival how were you out of integrity like explain it to someone who doesn't understand so we just became desperate or i became desperate for the money to make the festival work is that what wire fraud is is to just you just like raise money off false pretenses yeah so like wire fraud is super super broad it's like Hey, yeah. you know, if I tell you my apartment's worth a million bucks, you know, give me a loan against it and it's not worth that. And you give me money like that's wire fraud. Got so it. like any any exaggeration about like something's value or something's worth to get money is like technically wire fraud. So, yeah, I lied to the investors about how well the company was doing. And like it was really bad. And, you know, I was saying we had more revenue than we did, blah, 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 because I was desperate for the cash. It's so like that was a true crime. Uh, but the money was spent legitimately trying to execute the festival and like. That was pure just stupidness on my part, not to zoom out and be like, shit, this is not. Going so it to sounds like you made this, this kind of like public promise to do this festival. And then you realize it starts to get away from you and you're getting, and you got desperate to make it happen. And so you, and you needed to bring in the cash. And so I think what, what you're saying is you exaggerated to the investors to bring that money in, but yeah. your intention was still then to use the money and pull off a successful festival. Absolutely. How I think much money did you raise? A G one. I have recommended it to my dad, my family, my friends. It is such an efficient way to get in prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes. All you have to do is one scoop for gut support, magnesium, B vitamins, energy support, vitamin C, everything in one scoop. It's absolutely amazing. I personally love using this when I travel or when I'm on the go. So I'll bring a frother when I travel and I'll do a scoop in water. I like it icy. 
Sometimes I add a little lemon and then I froth it up. Michael is the one who told me about AG1. He has it as his morning ritual. He does it every single morning. And I started to like get involved and be like, what is that? Started trying it, loved how it tasted and just found it to be something that was really versatile. I'm always on the go. I'm always traveling. So to have AG1, especially their little travel packs in my bag is a move. AG1 is the supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily, and that's why they've been a partner for so long. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 K2, and you get five free AG1 travel packets with your first purchase. These are the packets that I love on the go. You get five free AG1 travel packs. Go to drinkag1.com slash skinny. That's drinkag1.com slash skinny. Check it out. I will say something, and this is hard to admit. When my wife is right, she is right. Let's talk about branch basics. If you're like most people that have grown up in this country, you probably grew up with all sorts of nasty, chemical, toxic cleaning products. I know that I did. No fault of my parents. I just didn't know better. And with that, we're exposed to so many things that affect our health, our safety. It wasn't until my wife introduced me to Branch Basics and we had the founder of Branch Basics on the show that I really started to dive into this topic and learn a lot more. Now that we've removed all of the toxic chemicals from our house, anytime I'm around them, I smell and notice and feel much different. I actually feel worse. Since we've implemented Branch Basics into the house, which is so easy to do, by the way, and I'll talk about that in a second, I feel way better. My sleep's better. My energy's better. I don't have any allergies. I just all around feel like I'm making a much better choice for myself and our family. It's such an easy change to make. Just listen to the episode we did with the founder on this podcast, and you'll learn all sorts of reasons why. And the great thing about Branch Basics is it can be used to clean your floors, do your laundry, your bathrooms, but it's also safe enough to wash with your produce and everything else. It really is an extremely clean product. Their premium starter kit will provide you with all the bottles you need to replace all of your toxic cleaning products. So check them out today and definitely check out the episode that we did with the founder of Branch Basics on this show. Save 15% and get free shipping when you use code SKINNY at www.branchbasics.com. Again, that is code SKINNY for 15% off plus free shipping when you purchase starter kits. That's branchbasics.com, promo code SKINNY. I truly have the hack to getting your baby to sleep through the night. I know this because I've been using this hack since Towns was born, and it is an absolute game changer. I wish I had this when Zaza was a baby. It really would have changed my life. Dreamland Baby. They have the dream weighted sleep sack. And let me tell you, it is so amazing. This sleep sack makes a lot of sense to me. It's lightly weighted, and I use a lightly weighted blanket when I'm winding down. So knowing that there's a lightly weighted sleep sack for babies makes a lot of sense. And the one that they have just hits all the right spots with the baby. I mean, I'm telling you, Towns falls asleep faster. He loves his crib and he also stays asleep longer. But most importantly, and this is really weird, he associates the lightly weighted sleep sack with sleep. So right when I pull it out, he knows it's time to go to bed. It's time to wind down. I tell every single mother on the planet when they text me about having a baby to sleep through the night that they have to get Dreamland Baby's sleep sack. Okay. Comes in neutral colors. It's really pretty. You should know that Dreamland is having their biggest sale of the year. Go to dreamlandbabyco.com and use code SKINNYBONGO23. That's skinny, B O G O, 23 at checkout. And this is a buy one, get one free weighted product steal. This is a great way to stock up on Dreamland baby products or give it as a holiday gift. That's skinny, B-O-G-O, 23 at checkout. Uh, like 27 or 28 million. Wow. Ish. Yeah. That, you know what though? That's and a you're lot of money. Years old when this to, happens. A lot of money. That's yeah. a lot of money to raise at 24 years mm-hmm. old. To me, that's the, that, that's impressive that you raised that much money. I mean, what was your strategy with that? I was just, it was trust. That's why it's so fucked up. It's because these people... Some of the investors were new, but a lot of them had backed me for five or six years. So when I call them and say, hey, listen, guys, like this company is bigger than the previous ones are working on. Like, who are they to question me? Because they had seen me be honest and fail and succeed in little ways for so long. So. And are these celebrities, well-known people or are these people that are behind the scenes in business? Uh, more so in the business side. You know, we did have some more like celebrity type investors as well, but most of them were traditional like technology 
venture capital, VC type investors. Are the investors calling you when the festival is going on being like, I'm watching this on social media and it looks like a disaster? Or did they not even know anything was going on? The, the hardest part to handle as the festival is failing where all the investors were, of course, calling and every single one had different directions and different feedback. Fuck. And it's like, how do you handle 20 really, really smart people who are all like great in their own ways telling me complete opposite things? And like, that was so challenging because I was trying to deal with a thousand people to get them home, X number of hundreds of you know contact contractors who were there. And now a couple dozen investors all telling me like, do this, don't do this, don't do this. And then I do one, one thing that one says and someone else yells at me and it's like trying to learn how to deal with that is what wasn't prepared for it. What were they all telling you? Like, what was some of the direction? I mean, the smart ones were saying, shut the fuck up, like get everybody home safe and like say nothing. And other ones were giving me complete opposite feedback. Like that you needed to make a statement. Yeah. Like go on all the media, like start selling tickets for next year. We want our money back. You know, I've, I've heard every possible like piece of advice you can imagine. And then it really hit me the next morning. This one investor who I really respect at the time just calls me and says, hey, you have to do this or else you're going to be in the cover of Wall Street Journal in handcuffs. And like, I didn't fathom what I had done was a crime. It was so obviously a crime looking back now. I deserve to go to jail. Like I did break the law, but I just like couldn't comprehend it. And he's like, you're going to be in handcuffs in the front page of the newspaper unless you do X, Y, and Z. What did he tell you to do? Basically give him his money back. <laughs> but, but, but at that point. I didn't have it. Yeah. It, it Are was, you it like turning spent. your phone off after this? Uh, no, I, 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 I didn't know what to do. I thought like I could work myself out of the problem. So I was talking to everybody, trying to get feedback and come up with ideas and like, it was all stupid and if i had to do it again i would sit down shut up get everybody off like say nothing and you know kind of plead guilty as quickly as possible and get what, on my life what's it like to be riding that high and having that momentum and success in business and then get to the moment where you're about to you know in your mind pull off this successful festival to the next day nightmare scenario being charged with the crime having the world and your investors kind of turn against you like what's going through your mind personally at that time I think what was so weird was that I was running these businesses and had all these employees and all these people calling me, then all these investors I'm reporting to, and then news breaks, I'm getting charged with a crime and no one calls me. Like my phone goes completely silent. So it went from like constant stresses where I'm scared to check my phone every 30 seconds. To now my phone is completely dead. And, how, and how many, everybody's how, just scared to call. It was like literally after dropped. do you get charged? Uh, the investigation started like right after I came back to the US. And so it went from, I'm in the middle of a shitstorm. Then my phone, like, I couldn't pay someone to pick up my phone call. Wow. So it just like totally do you, went black Do you have white. a girlfriend or a partner or anyone at this time helping you through this? Or is it just you on your own? Uh, at this point, it's just kind of, you know, no, no, no one's serious at that point, no. Okay. And so did you have someone within the company that you worked with helping you, like, really by your side? Or was it really just falling It really went you? from, like, I felt like I had 100 super close friends to, like, zero overnight. And oh. yeah, and why do you think so many people turn to you just because they found out that you lied and they were obviously disappointed? Or? I think people are just get really. I, I'm so scared of the government now. Like you know, I, I would laugh if you told me to be scared of them seven years. I would have laughed at you. But like now, I'm scared, and I think that people are just scared. And even if you're totally innocent, like it's expensive to defend yourself, whether it's civilly or criminally. Like just being involved in in legal action is just not cheap, and it's scary. And like if you are in the midst of that. And at that point, I was a lightning rod, whether it was getting lawsuits from everybody or like criminal actions, like no one wants to be associated with someone who's kind of going through that storm. And like, I get it. And when you say you're scared of the government, are you scared because you went to jail and saw like a different, a different side? What do you mean? Yeah, I just like saw what could happen. Right. And like, I think I did 10 months total in solitary confinement. And, <sighs> wow. I, you know, I, I kind of, I grew up in a suburb in New Jersey, like being taught the world is fair. And of course, I was guilty and deserved everything that came of it. But like also to see that someone could snap their fingers and literally put you in a cage for 10 months, like that scared me. It's like there is someone out there who can literally go like this and like your life is over. And like that's frightening when I didn't know that quite existed before. How are you managing your stress when you're going through all this? And what I mean by that is when you're being charged and there's yeah. people throwing lawsuits at you and you're having to go and defend yourself, like how are you managing your stress levels? Because I, I imagine at that point, it's impossible to effectively run the businesses at all. So nobody's getting their money back. Yeah. And the other side of that is you're wondering every day if your freedom's going to be taken from you. Like, what, what are you doing to manage your, your mindset? Yeah, it sucks. And arguably like that period when things are falling apart is worse than like going to jail or it's like worse than actually like knowing what the consequence was. So I imagine when you get to jail, it's like, okay, this is happening now. You're yeah. And you can deal with it. At least there's an end date. Like mm -hmm. where it's uh -huh. like, okay, like 
it's going to be absolutely miserable. But, you know, in this year, I can at least go home and still be semi young and like have a life. But not knowing is like certainly the hardest part. At I'm what like, point do you think that jail is an actual possibility? Like, did you, when you were going through this, did you ever think that you were actually going to see the inside of a jail cell or were you thinking, hey, you'll, you go through here and a slap on the wrist? So I hired a lawyer and then like, he's like, all right, let me see what the situation is. And then he calls me in a week later. He's like, Bill, you're going to jail. <gasps> so he's like, yeah, he's like, you know, I talked to the government and, you know, they have you and I was totally guilty. And he's like, you're going to jail. So, so are you at home when he calls you and says No, I mean, yeah, I go to his office. I'm mean, like, I'm in his office and he's like, yeah, you're going to do some years in jail. And how do you receive that news? Uh, He's like, he calls me and he's like, Billy, you should call your family. Like you're going to be going to jail. And this is, this is like maybe like nine months before we actually go. So, but it, I mean, like when, when you get that news, yeah. what's your reaction? I would say, oh, like why so long? And then like, he would explain to me because of the dollar amount, you get certain timelines based on how much money you lose, blah, blah, blah. And like, I'm trying to argue it and like still trying to fight back and not fully accepting the reality of it. He's like, oh, well, I only lost this much, not this much. And you know, like my mindset was totally wrong. It was like, yes, you were guilty. And like, Shut the fuck up. You're going to go to jail, but it's going to end. And like, I wish I knew to just like, just chill out. There's a total of six years, right? I was sentenced to six years, served just over four. What did your parents time, yeah. say when you called them and told them this news? I think the biggest thing I learned from jail is the sentence is way harder on like your family and friends. Because when you're going through something, like at least you know what's happening in real time. But when you're not there and you can't see what's happening, your mind just goes to like the worst places. So I just felt the worst for all family and friends. Just well, and I'm sure when you're family. inside, your parents are extremely worried for you as well. Yeah, they're, they're scared and they just don't know what's happening, right? Like you, you hear prison and you're just like, like that's fucking off. Like what, what's going on? Like what's he doing? Like is he alive? And it's just, it's a tough time. Why did you have to go into solitary? Is uh, this nonviolent yeah. crime, right? I went twice. I went first time for three months, second time for seven months. Um, the first time I was trying to write a book and I had like a USB recording device. So totally broke the rules and deserved it. Went to uh, solitary for three months. Second time I tried doing a podcast interview over like the jail payphone, and that was not a good idea. They, they, they caught you. Yeah, they didn't like that. Are you not allowed to do that? No, you are, but like it's kind of like the weird thing where it's like not against the rules. Like you still have, even in jail, you still have your First Amendment rights. So I didn't really break any rules, but they weren't really sure what to do. So they just put me in solitary for seven months. And that was brutal because they would like fuck with me mentally and like, Billy, you're not getting out of here. You're doing 10, 10 years in solitary confinement, 20 years. And they would just fuck with me. And I had no oh. phone calls, like no way to access the outside world. I was like going crazy. Like, fuck, am I literally going to be in this box for 10 years for doing a damn interview? <laughs> like, they fuck with you yeah. on top of it? Yeah, so that was the hardest part. What? That is twisted yep. to, to say that. I mean, that's, that, that is like, that's mean. That's cruel. Crazy. So were you even allowed to read? Uh, you were allowed two books a week. And it sounds like a lot for a normal person. But when you have absolutely nothing else to do, you, you read like even if you're a slow reader you read a book a day because like literally 24 7 you're locked in a cage so i never understood that like why can't we have more books but it wasn't the fight i was able to pick at the time I know. So, when you you're growing up nice kid in new jersey your first day going in what's that experience like i imagine you're terrified yeah i think i just didn't like once again didn't respect the prison etiquette initially uh prison is very very behind racially, socially than the world is. And it's probably like 50 or 60 years behind. And then like growing up as an adult in Manhattan, it's probably a hundred years behind like New York City. So not understanding that like there are these like weird social norms that you have to conform to. Like it, what? It took like, I mean, everything is just super fucking racist. And like, if I went and talked with a non-white person, the white guys would get mad and like cause drama over it. And like, you know, it's like, it's like as simple as that. And causing drama and like trying to explain to them like, well, I get along better with, you know, a 25 year old black kid from Brooklyn than a 60 year old like guy with a swastika on his forehead. So it's like, why well, do I have to sit with this guy when I prefer to sit with this guy? And like, I just didn't understand like how to. And what happens if you those. kind of step outside those bounds? They check you pretty quick. I, I guess I was like too like, I wouldn't say confident, but too like, why can't I? Like, why can't I talk with a guy I'd rather hang out with than someone like like you? And like, try to fight back or push back a little bit. And like, it took a couple months to realize like at some point it's got to stop causing. Like, stop causing drama along the way. And but do you ever fear for your well-being in there? There was like a couple times early on, I was in the Brooklyn Detention Center, which is pretty rough, where like, you know, some guys would threaten stuff and like, yeah, but it, it all ended up working out and nothing ever terrible happened. But saw, you know, saw someone or like guy in the cell next to me got raped and like saw many people get stabbed. Someone commit suicides. Like it was bad. Like there was things. So happening. how do you stay out of all that? Like, especially when you're doing as much time as you did. Biggest thing, it's all about money in jail. 
And a lot of people get in trouble because they owe people money. And most of the bills come from drugs. And I've never been a drug person, like never done hard drugs in my entire life. But a lot of guys come in there, they're super depressed and they start doing hard drugs and racking up debts to others when they can't pay those bills when the drama comes. So if you stayed away, like ultimately from the drugs and the gang situations, like no one's going to bother you because people are in there to do their gang stuff and make money from the drugs. And were you recruited to be in a gang when you were in there? No. And I think like that's like a misconception a little bit too, is you don't have to like join a gang. And like generally you hang out with people from your same area. So like there's New York guys, there's Philadelphia guys, whatever. So like, you'll hang out with the guys from your certain area. You're not in a gang, but no one really like bothers each other unless you're owing money or trying to get into like, if you're dealing drugs, people get mad. But if you stay out of that whole business, like no one really cares. What was the most or who was the most interesting person that you met in jail? Like is, there's got to be like a person. So I, many. Yeah, I bet. So I think the biggest shock was, you know, we're taught in life. There are good guys and bad guys. And I get into jail and I think that like there's such a small percentage of the population that's actually bad people. And like, sure, maybe 5% of the guys in jail are like actual terrible human beings who should never get let out. The rest are just like somewhere else on the same spectrum that the rest of the world is. And, you know, due to circumstance, due to desperation, they committed a crime that somebody else might have too if they were put in that same spot. So I think like that was eye opening. Um, yeah, I had a friend from Chicago who at 19, he robbed a Walgreens. And since it was a pharmacy, it was a federal crime. And he got Ugh. like 10 years in jail. And like the sweetest kid in the world, super nice, super talented. And like just got out now at like 28. So like lost, you know, lost his 20s from, from robbing, I think he got like $140 or something, oh. which is just like absurd. And like felt so bad for him, but like an amazing, amazing human being. So. Because you're famous for, for all of this and you're in jail, was there a scarlet letter on your back because of that? Or was it like glitzy and glam to be famous in prison? I think it's tough knowing that at the end of the day, like, People are after themselves in their own careers, right? So I think it's pretty obvious that like if you got me in trouble, you know, it's you're gonna get a bigger star on your on your like on your desk than if you get somebody else in trouble who is in jail for 30 years and like has no family, has no friends, right? So it did feel like I was a little bit of a target and like that sucks. It just like sucks knowing that it was like because you're saying like maybe the government had to make an example of you because it was so public. I think like once I'm in jail, though, even on like a like a micro level, right? Like, hey, hey, hey if a guard catches me doing something wrong, I'm sure I'll get a pat in the back type of thing. Like, I certainly felt like I was being targeted in situations like that where they would, you know, come and try to catch me doing like stupid things. So that was frustrating. This is a weird question, but yeah. I just want an, an, to know I'm obsessed with with jail. I find it to be so interesting. If someone was going to jail, like what advice would you tell them? So. Most people who commit financial crimes will go to what's called like a camp, which yeah. is an insecurity place. And well, that's why I'm so surprised where you went. I started there and like okay. that's where I had the USB device and got in trouble. Um, in reality there, it's just like boredom and separation from your family are the two biggest like enemies. And you're not seeing any of the gang stuff, any of the violence. It was like due to my stupidity that I was escalated levels and exposed to those different jails. And you went to Detroit. So right. I, my last jail was in Milan, Michigan, which is like outside of Detroit. Okay. And yeah. So if fun. someone was going to jail, what would you tell them? I think like you'll probably meet three or four great friends. <laughs> like that's the silver lining of it. Uh, yeah, I think you definitely form a certain bond with people who go through a crazy experience together. But there also are like truly bad people too that you just like don't know existed in the world. And for example, there were tons of these like child molesters. And I would sit there in these rooms and be like, if you offer me my freedom right now, I cannot go go out in the world and find 20 of these guys. And like somehow there's there's hundreds of them right here. So it's like it is kind of like a, a, a crazy experience. When you are in jail, is that when the documentary came out? Yes, I was in jail when they came out. And it, did you see the press surrounding it from jail or no? So people watch TMZ religiously in jail. Like that is the must watch TV every day. I think it's it's a way to connect with the world. Yeah. So I was like walking by the TV room and like I saw my like fat face pop up on TMZ. Are oh, people they're, saying like they're yeah, they're like, play, play, look, I turn around. It's like dueling documentaries. I'm like, oh, fuck. What and do I, you mean your fat face? You're thin. I was so fat like during this fire time. <laughs> I was super fat. How did you lose weight? Uh, I think like once I got back to New York and the investigation stopped and they stopped like going to four dinners a night. <laughs> like just you know. Well, I imagine the stress too. Yeah, the stress too, for sure. So oh, yeah. when you get out of jail, what is that day like? So I was sentenced to a five months in the halfway house after jail, which is oh, basically like a jail that you can leave. And that was in Brooklyn. Uh, I just remember my parents picked me up in a rental car in Milan, Michigan, 
they give me a Timberland wallet with $200 and 20s in it. And they're like, good luck. I'm like, well, it's probably not going to buy me a pair of jeans or whatever. So I go to the halfway house and like get to work and try to get back to life. And how, what's that transition like? It's so much harder than people think. And I yeah. thought like, I thought I would run out of jail and then everybody who had believed in me before would like call me or like meet with me. And the reality was like, no one would pick up the phone. And it probably took like six months. I mean, some people picked up the phone, but it probably took like six months to get back to a place where I can actually like have real relationships again. So that was hard. Quick break to talk about Armra. We just had Dr. Sarah on the show to talk all about the benefits of colostrum and specifically Armour colostrum. You guys know that I'm always on the lookout for great supplements, and this one is an absolute game changer. If you want to strengthen your immunity, improve your gut health, improve your fitness metabolism, and enhance your skin or hair, which everyone wants to, then I highly suggest you check out Armour. Not only do I take it, Lauren takes it, our children even take it, and we are on fire. With kids back in school, especially right now in the winter season, we want to boost our immune system. So everyone in the family is taking this and we have not been sick since. It's super simple to use. The way we do it was we actually just dump the powder in our mouth. But if you want to just put it in water and stir it up, you can also do that. And for those that want to know a little bit more about colostrum, colostrum is the first nutrition we receive in life and contains all of the essential nutrients our bodies need in order to thrive. Arma has a proprietary concentrate of bovine colostrum that harnesses over 400 living bioactive nutrients that rebuild the barriers of your body. This is every single barrier in your body to fuel cellular health for hosts of research-backed health benefits. Like I said, it strengthens your immunity, ignites metabolism, it's anti-inflammatory, it fortifies your gut health, and it activates hair growth and skin radiance. That's been an absolute game changer for myself and our family. To check it out, we've worked out a special offer for our audience. Receive 15% of your first order. Go to tryarmra.com slash skinny or enter skinny to get 15% off your first order. That's T-R-Y-A-R-M-R-A dot com slash skinny. Tryarmra.com slash skinny. Let's talk about Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers is the number one doctor recommended weight management program and the trusted authority in evidence-based weight health. Beyond the science, joining Weight Watchers means you become part of a powerful, passionate community. They're all about community there. We got to learn all about that when we had the CEO on our podcast. The company's purpose is to always inspire healthy habits and lasting weight loss. So how they do this is they focus on behavior change, nutrition, science, and real connections while never giving up on the food that we all love. Personally, I really love how they've evolved their approach to weight loss over the years, and they're really like with the times, which I appreciate. Weight Watchers has helped millions of members on their journeys over the years, and recently they've launched Weight Watchers Clinic, and this provides support to even more people across the weight health spectrum. Most importantly, I think that Weight Watchers knows that weight management is not a one-size-fits-all thing. There are behavioral and biological factors to consider. So they really have a multifaceted approach when it comes to losing weight. Head to www.com slash TSC to see if you qualify. If you do, use our code TSC25 to get your first month free. Plus, you get $25 off your second month. That's www.com slash TSC. You have seen me on Instagram story and you've seen a visual of my skin Probably 60% of the time, I'm wearing like a really great oil, a serum, maybe some like under eye situation. And I'm always wearing a mineral SPF that's tinted. And the one that I've been using is One Skin. So I've showed this on my Instagram, but basically I got to interview one of the founders of One Skin and I learned all about their products. Their products are validated by dermatologists to significantly improve firmness, reduce fine lines and strengthen the skin's barrier, which is all really important for skin health. And their products are designed around that. So to know that their SPF is vegan, cruelty-free, fragrance-free, and it has a skin-safe seal of approval, plus it has results, is awesome for me. I love this sunscreen. I've been telling my friends about it. It lays so nicely under makeup, and the ingredients are amazing. If you're going to check out another one of their products, I would get their eye topical. I have been using this eye cream, and I can tell that it's strengthened underneath my eyes. I know that sounds so weird, but the skin's so delicate and it's actually firmed up the skin under my eyes. Go check out their tinted 
mineral sunscreen and grab their eye topical. You won't be sorry. Visit oneskin.co and use code skinny15. You get 15% off your first purchase. That's oneskin.co and use code skinny15 for 15% off your first purchase. It's interesting. We've I've, I've talked to people that have um, done stints in prison yep. or in jail, and they say in some ways, like a lot of the day-to-day stress of life kind of goes away while you're in there because you can't, mm-hmm. like you're not running a company, you're not paying right. bills, you don't have a mortgage, you, you know. Did you experience any of that while you were there? I think when you're in jail, you glamorize outside life so much where you just remember the best moments. Yeah. Moments with your friends and your family and like, you know, that great birthday dinner you had and like whatever exciting like life moments you had and you forget about the bad stuff and it's like your like body's way of protecting you and like keeping you going right so i think a lot of people are surprised by you know the reality of life i think for me just the hardest part was like the community i was in like was not okay with like having a friend right who went to jail so it's kind of like getting back to life was i was more prepared for like the stress of like life and like less prepared for like fuck these hundred people who I thought would be like running to me aren't picking up my phone call. Did, just, did like, anybody come to come back? Yeah, I had like four or five friends who were really, like who I probably didn't expect to step up, like really, really stepped up and helped me right away and like forever grateful to them. And but that, that part was definitely tough. There's for if I'm you, I wouldn't want those friends, though, in my life moving forward anyway. Though. For sure. Like it's you know with all you've been through and they, and they don't want to talk to you it's kind of like bye yeah but it's hard like i've had friends get shit at work right like they'll work at a big tech company or at a big bank or at a law firm like oh well, why are we with him like you know so it's, it's still tough and it's not necessarily like their thoughts it's like the social pressure they get to and that just sucks and I, I feel bad for those people so there has to be though some kind of road to uh Redemption. to getting better and yeah. to redemption. Yeah, there has to be some kind of road. I mean, I think that it's unfair to just be put you in a box forever. I don't think that's fair. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I think what's what's sad too is a lot of really capable people who go to jail, like they just give up, right? And they don't try to do anything with their lives after. And they kind of just like sit at homes and play video games all day long. Like, oh, well, like the world's against me. And I think that mindset's like terrible. But and I could, but I could see why that happens now because it it is tough and it did take so much longer than I thought to you know get back to some sense of reality. Well, the part of the, you know one of the reasons we wanted to have you on here is I think for this part, which is you have this experience, you have this failure that ends with your incarceration, and then now you're from what I'm seeing, you're you're back on the horse again. Um, and I guess what we're wondering is like. You're doing this. You're doing Fire Festival too. So I can't. I yeah. can't tell if this is like one of the dumbest things, or if you have some <laughs> of the biggest balls in the world, or like the motivation to go back. Is this to kind of prove to yourself that you could that you can do what you set out to do the first time, or like why why go back to this again after everything? Like I'm obsessed with paying people back, and that is not just financially. And like yes, it's a big part of it, but I think other part of it is rebuilding trust. I think there's like so much in me where I want to be like, hey. Yes, I was totally an asshole for this period of time and I was totally wrong, but I'm not that bad guy. I'm the guy who you initially believed in. And I want to prove that I'm still that person. And that's why I want to do Fire Festival too. So I, how do you even begin to start? Okay, say that I'm an investor sure. and you come to pitch me. Pitch him, pitch him. Say, I want to hear hey, why you pitch yeah. because damn, $27 million. No, 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 I know, it's crazy. It's crazy. Of money, man. Because if you come to me and say, hey, I have an idea for Fire Festival 2 and I need to raise money and I'm just yeah. a basic guy and I'm like, let me Google and see what happened with Fire Festival 1. I would think that the chips are a little bit stacked against you. I disagree. Yeah. You know what? Billy, no, I, I disagree. I, wanna know, I, wanna I don't want to start, start the fight. Here. I think <laughs> that he has so much to prove. No, but I'm just wondering how and that you... He, I, I think he's going to have this, um, this moment where he proves everyone wrong. I really do. Well, I hope he so. He spent so much time thinking and being quiet in jail and strategizing and planning. I actually think that he's going to pull it off. Well, it looks like you are, but I'm wondering like how you even start approaching people with, hey, I'm doing this thing again after sure. the first experience. It's, it's a great question. Everybody asks that question, which I love. And I think since 2016, Fire has been the most talked about festival in the world. Uh, Coachella is in second place and it's like three and a half times as many like mentions and you know uh, appearances that Coachella has had since then. And I, I was talking to some like some big festival company. I'm like, 
what would you have to do to start a festival next year and get the awareness of fire? It took spending $28 million, committing crimes, going to jail, having multiple documentaries. Like it was almost this perfect storm that was needed to create this brand awareness. So if a professional can come in and actually do it right, you don't have to worry about any of that brand awareness. It would cost you so much money and so much time otherwise. So I think like that's the opportunity. And what's it's, crazy People to me, know about it. So if it's done I'm right, I'm sold, Billy. It's good. Yeah. I'll be an investor. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go. <laughs> are we going to Fire Festival too? Uh, you, you guys are definitely coming. Uh, I'm sold. I'm honestly sold. I'll, I think that you, you're, you're smart. You have a lot to prove. You, you want to do the right thing. And I think you're going to do it. Well, it sounds like people wanted this thing to be a success from the beginning. Obviously, you didn't get all these people to sign up and all these artists to participate. Like they believed in the vision. It's just the execution of it was, was not up to par. Yeah. The execution was terrible. The line to investors was terrible. But if I can separate myself from that and have like a professional company do the logistics, yeah. have someone manage the money, like then we have a really, really great chance to make a good story. You know what I would do? I would have it all set up. Like, say it's on Friday. I would have it all set up on Monday. So you can just feel really good yeah, about it. <laughs> good and then you can go and like show on social media that it's already, Ready. the infrastructure is already set up and you can feel good about it. I think where one of the, where you got in trouble in one of the instances is like, it sounds like a, like a lot got procrastinated mm -hmm. till the very last second. So you were like, fuck, what do I do? And that's where the scrambling happened. If I would set it all up so you're just chill that week. Yep, I like that. I don't know if that's like way more money. You might need a couple more investors to have it set up that long. But then you're like, you can have like actually enjoy it and savor it. And sleep the night before. Yes. <laughs> I yes. have a personal question. Sure. So I, a lot of people that listen to this show, you know, they've experienced failures. I mean, we all, we all experience failures. But I think getting back up and continuing to try is the thing that, in the end, will will make people either win or lose, right? If you you don't, I, I believe you don't really fail unless you just quit trying. Having the experience that you had and crashing and burning as hard as you did, and like you didn't just lose a business, you yeah. lost your freedom. How do you get back on the on the horse per se? Like how do you how do you find it? To, how do you, how do you start to say okay, like I'm going to take another swing at this? I think the the pessimistic view here. I think that small failures are really good for you. I think that huge failures are actually like devastating. And I think the reality is most people can't come back from huge failures. And like I saw it with a lot of capable guys in jail who just can't recover from it. And it's, it's really, really sad. And you would classify yours as a huge failure. I do. I think it's super hard to come back from. I think all the little failures I had leading up to that were very, very beneficial. And this one probably wasn't. Um, but at the end of the day, I think there's so many times when after we failed and we want to get back started again, we predict problems, right? Like, oh, well, if we start doing well in six months, this is going to happen. Well, in nine months, this is going to happen. In 12 months, this is going to happen. In reality, almost all of those problems end up sorting themselves if you just take action. So I think like, don't think about what problems you might have in the future. Just like, just start going now and those problems will most likely disappear. And how do you block out noise from the naysayers and for people? Because, you know, I, we're, we're researching, you read the comments yeah. and people, you know, there's a lot of people saying a lot of nasty shit, obviously, because they have the perspective of the, of the documentary. But how do you kind of block out that noise and set out to prove those people wrong? Interesting. I think it's kind of like if you walk in light rain, like you're getting mad, like when a little drop hits you. Right. But if you go swimming in the ocean, like you just like forget you're wet. So at a certain point, there's just like so much shit that I stopped paying attention to like the bulk of it. So in a weird way, like once you have nothing to lose, you know, it becomes more stress free. I think that everyone when it comes to online personalities, sometimes they they build you up so high and then they tear you down. But I also think that people want to see like an underdog win. And I think the internet, when you do fire two and you do it right, is going to surround him with positivity. I'm going to just put that out. Well, there. no, I think it's good that you're doing these kind of shows because I think it gives people a much different perspective. Yeah. Right. Like when I hear your story, I'm like, okay, here was a young guy, very ambitious that set out to try to create a great experience for people, but fell short on the delivery and also was out of integrity a bit. But I don't look at you like, man, this guy was out to rob people and he was out to steal people's money. And like, obviously, you're not sending all these people to an island with the intention that they're going to have a bad time. Sure. Um, and I think it's good that you're doing these because I I think it it humanizes you a lot more than, you know, somebody showing you on a documentary and giving their outside perspective. Yeah. Unfortunately, like the salacious stories are always better, right? Like, you know, 
he stole twenty million dollars and went and partied on a yacht. Like it's a, it's a better story than no. And, and listen, details. there's yeah. obviously a lot of issues in this country with the justice system, but I don't think anyone can listen to okay, like you made some mistakes, but six years of your life was taken from yeah. you. Like that, and that happens, you know, to so many people, and and, yes. and they take much more time from a lot of people, and it's it's you know it's an injustice, but. Um, I think be people listening to this and saying, okay, he fucked up this festival, but like you, you paid a really heavy price. It's hard. And like, there are some days where you're depressed about the number. And then I go and meet someone who has 30 years and never hurt anybody. And it's like, wow, like I'm really grateful. So it's kind of like some days are great. Some days are terrible. It's just like hard to, hard to get there. I, I yeah, don't think I people can contextualize. I mean, like even when we were talking off air and you said, Hey, you were, you know, you missed basically all of COVID yeah. and you know, New York for six years and you get out and things are just completely totally different. different. Yeah. yeah. I don't think people Does realize. Does it really feel different? New York's like dangerous now. What do you like? What do you mean? It's weird. Like, <laughs> like when people, we've been coming here for the last like five years, all, like all the time. So I don't know what you mean. Like, what do you mean? I think like New York, you know, you would never think twice about walking down any street in Manhattan late at night six years ago. Huh. And like now you do. And I was almost mugged one night. Like some guy jumped out from behind a car to try to mug me. And like, I've seen other guys like having been in jail. I know what like the Jack boys look like now. I saw a couple of groups who are like looking for their like, looking for their targets. Like, like, wow, this is like the city has totally changed. So really, yeah, it's gotten more dangerous after COVID. Right? Oh. Lauren's oblivious to all that, which is yeah. I'm a little oblivious, yeah. Yeah. but you know, wh what do you want me to do? My, my, I have you. my content guy here, he got mugged, you know, a handful of months ago too. This camera stolen. Oh my God. Yeah. That's scary. Yeah, yeah Lauren, it could be scary. Lauren's like walking around la di da. In the I'm crowd. like, hi, how you doing? Are you, like, it used to be like that. Like it's like legitimately changed now. It's like this dark alley looks nice. Let's go down this one. But what's, you, what's cool now is the outdoor dining. So all the restaurants got like the outdoor permits during COVID. Yeah. And they just all stayed. Yeah, that so is cool. The summer was great. So like every restaurant that used to only be inside now had people outside all summer long. So that was like create a kind of fun, fun vibe. Have you had good experience going out in New York City and being in public? Have people uh, been like embracing you? 95% positive. I think people in general in New York are so caught up in their own bullshit where if they don't like you, they're not going to like even entertain the thought of like talking to you like, oh, they're too cool to acknowledge you. And then once you do say something, you're the ones who are supportive. So yeah, I that's think good. Yeah. I, just I, a New York mentality. When do you think that you're going to do fire two? Uh, end of next year. Into next year. So 14 months versus four. So we better get this right. What, what are you doing differently this time? Yeah, I want to know of, all the things you're doing differently. Uh, like having a real festival company do all the work. So okay. I, will, I will not be doing logistics. And I think my job here is to tell a really good story and to help craft it. So it's three days that you talk about forever. Like if I can do that, I win. And I should not be setting up stages, building bathrooms, building tents, like let somebody else do all of that space. What does the day to day right now look like mm -hmm. for an event? at the end of next year? I think right now it's just getting the best partners on board for everything, whether it's a festival, whether it's for a documentary. We're also working on a fire Broadway musical with a totally separate partnership, <laughs> which I think is going to be fucking wild. And like the guys doing it are so smart and creative. So I want to go see that. Yeah, I think that's going to be absolutely insane. It just takes time to get on Broadway. It like, takes a couple of years, but they're they're crazy. Uh, I think you have patience. You yeah. have, I bet you learned a lot, of, a lot patience. of patience. Yeah, a lot of patience. A lot of, a lot of long nights alone in a bunker. <laughs> oh, yeah, you have time to think. You have yeah. space. Crazy. How many people have already bought tickets or have you not opened it up yet? Uh, so we've sold, we did like the first 100 tickets okay. at the end of August. Those sold out in a little over a day. And cool. then, yeah, it's like that first drop went really, really fast. Um, and do you know where it's going to be? Uh, I know where it's going to be, but have not said publicly yet. Okay, is it going to be on an island? It's going to be on an island, yes. <laughs> oh my god i'm biting my tongue don't let me stay anymore okay sorry. we're rooting for you thank i'm you, rooting thank for you. you you guys will be there i would love to come you know what i like a cheese sandwich too <laughs> there you go. i like it on sourdough Before I commit, i do want to know who the uh production partners are and okay. who's, who's doing this good, good question. i'm gonna need a little more information he's gonna prove everyone <laughs> wrong you are thank i you. know you thank are you. do you find humor in all of this i think what my biggest dream right now is I want to like go shake the hand of everybody I fucked over. And these are mostly investors and be like, Hey, like I did it. I paid you back and not just money, but like you trust me now. I somehow like made up for your lost time. Like that'd be the coolest feeling in the world. So I want to get there. It'll take 10 years, but that'd be amazing. I, you're going to do it. Yeah, Thank you. You, you got, you know what? That could be fun. But. You can use this soundbite as an ad. There you go. Fire two. <laughs> Run it, you know. And yeah, in, 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 in 10 years when they're all paid back, yeah. you said it here. You said it here first. So is that all you're working? I mean, not all you're working on, but is that 
what you're like, is that your job by your festival too? And I just do a bunch of marketing work to keep the lights on. Got so it. help like venture backed startups just do marketing campaigns. And you're doing podcasts. And doing podcasts. Which is fun. Damn. Billy. You got a hell of a story, man. Where yeah. can everyone buy tickets? Firefestival2.com. And we'll see you guys there. <laughs> Curveball. Didn't realize we'd be pushing out Fire Festival 2. There, there are no tickets for sale. Doc, you can come on the website anyway. I have, sign up on the waiting list. Can I help you brainstorm for creative? I have yeah, like, please. why don't you do like baguette, like like beautiful bread yeah. with like a delicious super nice. brie cheese. And make cheese sandwiches like completely rebranded. Like super high end. I yeah, love it. make like I love the it. coolest fucking cheese sandwich anyone's ever seen. Will you serve them? Yes, that I'll, I'll serve idea. them Deal. in a bikini. Deal. All yeah, right. get get me there. Serve uh, Michael. Right, tickets back on sale then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is a good idea. It's a good More idea. clever, Lauren. <laughs> I have. A, 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 We're in. Creative. We're in. Like let's let's talk. I have Look, some ideas. Podcast. We'll dissect the. You know who else should um be on the billboard of this when you do mm-hmm. a billboard? What's the guy's name that you were looking at his Instagram? The guy, the 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 guy in the documentary. Andy King, the older guy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's 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 great. Okay, yeah. can we get he's him back on, on board, a billboard? Right? Back on board, yeah. Saying I'm back on board for sure. Yeah, like can we like we? I feel like we need to like. Why are we, we doing this now? Can we, we get Jaw Rule back? Uh, I don't know about that, but we'll, we'll stick with Andy King. Right, well. Yeah, let's stick with Andy King on the billboards steps. all yeah. over New York City. We can do better. <laughs> yeah, be like I feel like you need billboards to be like I'm back. I, I love it. Or we could like take pictures of really pretty cheese sandwiches and put them all over. That's the what city. we should do. We should, yes, that, that's, I'm I'm so in. It's a good idea. Good idea. Should the cheese sandwiches be in the billboards or more like a gorilla thing where we're just like? I think you should do wild postings. Mm-hmm. I actually have a person if you want me to connect you. Please. Uh, yeah, I have a great person. Okay. Um, you should do cheese sandwiches on the wild postings, okay. and then you should get Andy King's face on the billboards saying, uh, like something fucking cheeky and funny that yeah. everyone wants to post on their social media so you get free PR and you say we're back. I Part love it. Two. I love it. We're just going to get a huge orange billboard, Andy King's face and some great tagline. Let's I think that you should just take everything that everyone made fun of on the internet and, and, and do it better. How can you guys join the team? Let's go. Listen, I might have been, been convinced on this show. You know <laughs> what? Convinced. I'm telling you. <laughs> I love a I'm story. Shut this podcast down. I love a story <laughs> Let's get of redemption. Yeah, I, I mean, I, let me dissect the documentary, and I'll DM you a couple of my please, ideas. <laughs> please. Why did you never watch the documentary? They came out in jail, and I think at that time I would have been like so focused on what was true and what wasn't true, and that was the wrong response. But in hindsight, you've never wanted to go back and say like, "What?" It's too much. This? And now I'm like, now it's like my like ego. Uh-uh. It's like I'm not watching the shit. <laughs> so at some point, I will. I you think know, after the next one goes well, well I'll watch it. Don't okay. I don't think that he should let that negativity enter his ether on his next journey. Like, why even let that into his space? He's no, no, so focused you sh- on proving everyone wrong. I just think to watch that would be just well. Not bad. saying you should. I was just curious why you didn't. Yeah, like first, like just to kind of protect myself, and then like became a point of pride. And also, like in reality, most of the real like management level people didn't interview. I think if you have like a real career going on that wasn't just fire, you didn't want to be associated like with the failure, right? So it was mostly like ancillary people who weren't like there for most of the key moments. So I kind of felt like the true story wasn't told. And then that's something that I have. So whether it's a book or a movie or a Broadway show, like whatever it is, right? There'll be a time and place to to at least tell different versions of the events. And did they ever try to get you to participate? I interviewed for the Hulu one. But I think I sat down for like nine hours and it was chopped up to a couple minutes. And so it's like, it's tough, right? Oh my God. Uh, it's like in, you sat down for nine, nine hours. hours. I'm not sure how long my total talking time was in the actual doc, but it could have been more than what, three, four, five minutes. So. And why did that older man get so famous? I forgot. Because Andy he King. was, he, well, he was on the dock. And he yeah, was but just why, like, why, like what, what was so. I'm not going to say it. I mean, he's just a character, <laughs> you know? No, really. Why? I don't know exactly why he got so famous. He, he Jen, said, why did he get so famous? He was just quirky, I think. I think he was quirky. I'm not going to say it. What? Can you say it? Well, he did. So, I, I don't remember what he did. What did he do again? <laughs> Why is everyone could, we smiling? Could cut, we could cut it out of it. There, there was allegedly a shipment of Evian water held up in customs. Okay. And he said that he was going to go blow the guy <laughs> to get the water released. And like you'd say, I'll do whatever it takes. So that's like, that was his moment. He said, oh, I'll, yeah, it was the I'll whatever blow it takes the it. guy. Was he being funny? 
Well, it was news to me when it came. All I remember this jail guard came up to me and goes, hey, did you tell Andy King to go blow some like, government official? I'm like, wait, what? Oh, 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 <laughs> I'm like, oh. what, are you, what are you talking about? He's like, you could tell me. I'm like, what he's do you saying mean? that you said to go blow the guy. Yeah, yeah. But there, there was. But like, that's 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 being funny. I say that all the time. I, Who do I, I have to blow to get in? I had seen him since. I'm like, dude, what actually happened? He's like, oh, well, someone called me saying that you said that I need to go blow this guy. So he like, probably said, they, they probably said, Billy said, whoever you have to blow to get the water as a joke. Yeah, and it was taken like as a literal order. That's something I would say. So like I. And I was cornered in jail. I'm like, what are you talking? Like, I didn't remember this ever happening. And now I'm like, wait, what? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me think about that. There, yeah. there's, a, there's a slogan there. I know. Like you, you got to take that slogan. Whatever it takes. But yeah. Andy's back on board. All- I saw yeah, him. Yeah, Andy's back on board. I saw him doing some social promo with you. Andy's great. Yeah. I can't wait to see you thrive. Billy, thank you for coming on the show. What's your Instagram? Pimp yourself out. P-Y-R-T Billy. Pirate Billy. Pirate Billy. <laughs> I like it. Thanks didn't want to go. Didn't want to imply a little more under the radar with this. You just said straight probably, up probably coming back have. as a pirate. Yeah. That's not the okay. first mistake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's going to crash. Yeah, thank you, Billy. Thank you, guys. Well, that was a story. I hope you guys loved this episode with Billy McFarland. And I can't wait to see what he does with fire, too. We'll have to see. Make sure you're following us on Instagram at TSC Podcast. And if you want to watch any of our episodes, they are all up on YouTube. Simply search The Skinny Confidential. Enjoy.